just over a year down in Baton Rouge. And uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself and my story, and then we'll jump into uh, the seminar topic for this week. So I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, anybody from South Carolina here? All right. I see those hands. And... Uh, Grew up in Greenville and uh, became a Christian when I was 15 years old at a camp a lot like RYM. So RYM uh, means a lot to me. Uh, it was down the beach, the camp that I went to, uh, kind of the same schedule. And uh, in when I was 15 in 1990, when uh, many of your parents were in high school, um, and I was in high school, I came to the beach for one reason. And uh, that was to meet girls. And uh, but that that week, God had a different uh, plan for my life. And through teaching, and and mostly through my interaction with some Christian friends, God called me to Himself. Especially through a passage on the Bible uh, in the book of Titus, chapter three, verse five, that says. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. So I, I kind of had thought all along before then that being a Christian was about being a pretty good person. And that week I realized that uh, it was about what Jesus Christ has done for me. So went to college, went to seminary. I worked with an organization called RUF, Reformed University Fellowship, for 13 years. I worked at Delta State University. Does anybody know where that is? Delta State. Little school in uh, Cleveland, Mississippi, home of the fighting okra. So uh, that was our claim to fame. Worked there for seven years. Then I went to uh, work at at Louisiana State University. Anybody ever heard of LSU? Yeah, a few more people. Um, They used to be pretty good at football. Enjoyed working there and now still live in Baton Rouge. I have a 13-year-old daughter, a 14-year-old son, and uh, been married for 15 and a half years. So that's a little bit of backstory for me. One of my passions is to uh, teach young people like yourself about Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ and what Christianity is all about. So that's one of my hopes uh, this week is that we'll be able to to talk about Jesus and get to know Him better. Uh, This is my email address and my phone number. If you have questions, any questions, please email me, text me, call me, talk to your your youth leaders that are here. This uh, This just has the opportunity to be a great week, to raise a lot of questions, to stir up stuff in your own life and soul. And so I'd be glad to talk or talk to your... Uh, youth leaders, your chaperones that are here this week. All right, let me pray for us, and uh, as we get ready, appreciate if you silence your cell phones, and uh, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your faithfulness, your kindness. Thank you for this week and all of uh, the plans and the preparation that have gone into it. Thank you that we been looking forward to this week for months now, and I just pray that you'd work. I pray for folks that are here uh, in this room and on at camp that uh, are doing great, and their life uh, is just uh, just going along really well. I pray for folks that are that are struggling and battling with different things, maybe things that uh, no one else in this room knows about: uh, fears, uh, addictions, struggles. Uh, battles, Lord. I pray that you'd be at work in those, that you would give us hope that because you've come into this world, Lord Jesus, that you love us and that you can change us. And uh, just pray that you'd be with us today. Speak to us, we pray in your name. Amen. So uh, I want you to picture this. Uh, Your youth leader has finally decided that y'all are going to do something fun for a change. And uh, he decided uh, that you guys are going to go on a 10-day camping trip, a 10-day hike in the Rocky Mountains. 
And so uh, you plan everything, you get ready, um, you go get all your gear, you finally get a chance to use the North Face and Mountain Hardware stuff that you own, but you just have it even though you live in the South. And it's time to, to use all that stuff. You get a pack and you make this this epic road trip out to Colorado. You start to hike through uh, the Rockies. You're in the mountains. You're in uh, the woods. Let's just say that it's a pretty big group that you have this time. And there may be 30 students, just a few counselors. It really is something that that it could be just an incredible week, a wonderful a uh, wonderful trip. So you're going along, it's maybe day three or day four, you're comfortable, you kind of feel like you know what you're doing, and one late afternoon you you slip away, away from everyone else, you kind of fade off into the woods, away from them. Let's just say you're going to uh, take care of some business, if you know what I mean. And uh, you kind of take go over there, you don't want to be near anyone else, and uh, before you know it, it's starting to get dark. And uh, you thought you knew exactly where your group was and where they were going, and you'd get back onto the trail where they were, but uh, you kind of start to go back, but you lose your way. And then you find the trail, but it's already almost dark, and you have no idea where you are. You don't know where the rest of your, your group is. Uh, you start to get a little bit scared, and so you call out the names of some of your friends that are there with you. And then uh, your heart starts to beat a little bit faster, and you yell at the top of your lungs the names of your youth leader and the chaperones that are on the trip. And then you yell with all that you have, help, but there's no response there's no reply, and the reality starts to set in that you're going to be there by yourself in the Rocky Mountains, in the wilderness, uh, all night long. And maybe, maybe even longer. Your cell phone doesn't work, you're out of range, you have a pack with a few things in it. What are the things that you have to think about? What are the things that you have to, to take care of in order for you to be okay? What are some of the most basic things that you need to, to deal with? Yes? Your mental state? Good. That's not, that's not one that I thought of. That's, that's one you could just freak out and flip out and uh, there wouldn't be... Uh, next chapter. Good. What are some of the other most basic things that you need to take care of so that one day you can go home with your friends and family and everybody on the bus home and, and share a funny story about how you got lost in the woods? What are some of the most basic things that you need to take care of? Food, water, shelter, safety. Um, even though it's the summertime, it gets cold up there, you need to make sure that you had enough warmth. You, you, you change from the needs are... My, my needs today are that I uh, talk to that certain guy or girl and get to tell jokes to my friends. No, those things kind of fade away and the most basic life issues float to the surface. These are the things that we need to take care of. Safety, water, food, a way of escape, life. And I use that illustration to open us this morning because the I Am statements of Jesus Christ, um, they show us that Jesus is the source of our most basic spiritual needs. That's one of the first things I want us to think about together. Jesus is the source of our deepest needs. We're going to be looking at the I Am statements of Jesus this week. They're, they're passages from the Gospel of John that talk about uh, where Jesus says several things about who He is. And 
what's so incredible about those statements is they they touch us and they meet the deepest needs of our souls. He is the source of our deepest needs. And some of the I am statements speak to that those issues. I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the door. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the vine and you're the branches. And all of those things speak to our most basic needs as human beings. And Richie touched on it a little bit last night. Jesus reaches us. He comes to us and the basic provisions, protections, the way of escape, He gives us a glimpse of not only how to survive in life, but Jesus helps show us and provide a way for us to thrive in our lives. You know there's a difference, right? There's a difference in hanging on by a thread and just making it through every day, just surviving by substance substance living. And there's a difference between that and thriving and flourishing and blossoming and becoming the men and the women that God has made us to be. And that's what these I Am statements of Jesus are about. They're Him showing that in Himself He provides the most basic needs for our souls. So that's how I want us to start uh, our time together is Jesus is the source of our deepest needs. He meets those deepest needs. That's what we're going to be talking about. But as we as we think about that, we're faced with a counter reality, something that's also true in this world. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we'd be quick to uh, admit this. But it's this that we're tempted to look for satisfaction and fulfillment in other things. So even though Jesus is the source of our deepest needs. We look for satisfaction elsewhere. We look for satisfaction elsewhere. And what are some of the things that we that we turn to? We talked about a little bit last night in the small group questions. What are the things that we look to to provide rest for our souls outside of Jesus? What are some of the things that we that you think and that I think I have to have this in order to be happy and fulfilled and satisfied in my life? What are some of those things that we look to instead of Jesus for satisfaction? Great, the companion. And that's an example of a good thing. There are all sorts of good things that God gives us that we can make the ultimate thing. And that's when uh, we get derailed. That's when we mess up. When we, th- when we make that the ultimate thing. So some of the things I think for high school students, and these are some that I remember even though I went to high school in the dark ages, uh, I have to have success on the field in sports in order to be happy and fulfilled. I need just enough Instagram followers, just enough people to like my photos on Instagram or Facebook. I need a boyfriend or girlfriend. I need the right clothes. I need the right kind of selfie. No, that's not good enough. I need to take another one. Um, I need just a little bit of pornography every now and then in order for me to be happy. What are some of the things that people think they need, high school students in particular, think that they need in order to be happy and fulfilled? Well, maybe uh, it's escaping on the weekend through drugs or alcohol. Maybe it's, I think in order for me to be happy, my parents need to leave me alone. I need to live my own life. I need to find escape from the struggles and the stresses that I face. Maybe some of those are those are some of the ways that we look for that high school students and adults look for satisfaction elsewhere. And one of the realities of Christianity is that fellowship and communion with God is better than all of those other things that we run to, that we think will make us happy. 
a lot of people, I believe, they think about following Jesus and serving Jesus Christ and Him being your Master and Lord. A lot of people think of Jesus as this harsh, mean taskmaster, like the the meanest football coach you can imagine who just drives you into the ground all the time, running you down, running you down, you're not good enough. And what we heard last night is that Jesus is, is mild, He's lowly in spirit. He not only has power, but He's kind and compassionate. And uh, we look for satisfaction in other things, even though He's a source of our deepest needs. In, in 2006, I got to go to China for a couple weeks. It was a wonderful trip. One of the things we did, and it really wasn't on the agenda, but we kind of just stumbled into this this market, and it was kind of like a flea market. You guys ever been to the flea market before? People have little little booths set up, and uh, this was, uh, for lack of a better term, it was the fake market. And there were people selling stuff there that said uh, Nike, Adidas, North Face, Mountain Hardware. There were there were ping golf clubs you could buy. Uh, there were watches and DVDs and all sorts of things but they were all fake. They were all, uh, you know, just copies of the original. And not only was that, is that illegal, but uh, you get what you pay for. So the quality of those things wasn't the same. They would fall apart within weeks or months of you purchasing them. They were a fake substitute. They don't last. And that's, that's a small way to illustrate the fact that we run to other things that promise us satisfaction and Jesus is the real source of our satisfaction. He's the one that brings life to our souls. And there are two passages from the Bible that talk about this. If you brought your Bibles, uh, turn there with me. One is in Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a prophet from the Old Testament. And uh, this is kind of uh, God bringing His case against His people. His own people had kind of forsaken Him. And this is what God says through the prophet Isaiah. Could I get somebody to read that verse? Jeremiah, I'm sorry, Jeremiah. (laughs) Jeremiah 2, uh, verse 13. Thank you. Read it loudly, please. And wait for a second for people to find it. Um, Jeremiah 2.13 Okay, go ahead. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Okay, so God says through, through Jeremiah, my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And that's like... Another reference to how God takes care of our most basic needs. And what's the other thing that that the passage says that that people did? What's part of God's case against His own people? Yes? uh, He's saying people have taken me and they've they've just stopped using me. They've tried to make their own substitutes for me. Exactly. So they... He said they've, they've tried to hew out cisterns. You know what a cistern is? What's a cistern? Yeah. Some for carrying the water. Yeah, exactly. So in biblical times and New Testament times, uh, they didn't have pipes that brought water down into their homes. They would go to the river or to the well, and they would take these big clay pots and fill them with water, and they'd take them back to water uh, their animals, to have water for their families, and what is the problem with these cisterns that people tried to make themselves? Did they work very well? No, they were broken. Have you ever poured water into something that's broken or has a hole in it and it just it just, you know, goes all over the table, all over the ground? And that's That's such a powerful picture. If we try to to make something that can hold the substance of our lives, our dreams, our ourselves, if we try to hew out a cistern to hold it, 
It's going to be broken. It's not going to work. We can't do it. And that's one of God's indictments against us is that uh, you know, His people forsook Him and they tried to build cisterns to hold the water and that, that it can't hold the water. And, and what happens when we try to pour our lives into these other things, our, our hopes, our dreams, our lives just pour out on the ground filled with regret, filled with shame and guilt. So that's one of the things that one of the areas where we see that we look for satisfaction elsewhere. Another is from the prophet Isaiah, not Jeremiah, Isaiah, chapter 55. Isaiah 55, uh, verses 1 and 2. Can I get somebody to read those verses out loud? Thank you. Read loudly, please. Uh, Isaiah 55, 1 and 2. How all you who are thirsty come to the waters, and you who have no money come by and eat. Come by wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good, and you will delight in the riches of fair. Okay, thank you. So this is an invitation from God. Come everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters. Come and buy and eat by wine and milk without money and without price. So this is about the free offer of God's love and grace. You can come to me and find satisfaction and fulfilling for your souls. And then there's this question. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and why do you labor for that which does not satisfy? So this speaks to this very issue. God asks us, why do you try to find satisfaction and fulfillment in anything besides me? Because I give you the best things absolutely free. So those are those are some of the things, some of the passages that talk about how we try to find satisfaction and fulfillment outside of God. So Jesus is the source of our deepest needs. We're going to talk about that the rest of the week. Uh, we look for satisfaction elsewhere. And uh, he gives us a glimpse of how he meets our deepest needs. And I promise this was in my notes before last night, but it's from, from Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. This is a passage that Richie preached from last night. Do you remember what Jesus said? Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so this is, this is where Jesus speaks into uh, our lives. We're, we're tired, we're restless, we need help, we're burned out. And Jesus offers and provides rest for our souls. And one of the things that's really interesting is He says, He doesn't say, take every yoke off of you. You guys know what a yoke is, right? Not, not an egg yoke, but what is a yoke like mentioned here? What do you say? Yeah, it holds an ox or a horse. It's like a collar that would go over their neck and then they tie it up to the plow or the wagon and that would be the thing that enabled them to pull uh, and kind of fulfill what they're meant to do. And so we, we have all these things around us, this weight of stuff that just bears us. It's so heavy we can't, we can't stand the weight. And Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. It doesn't mean that the Christian life is easy, but living in relationship with God is the way that we're made to live. This may be a, kind of a ridiculous illustration, but I have a dog. I have a Boston Terrier. Has anybody seen a Boston Terrier before? Best dogs in the world. No, I mean, it's my dog. So. Uh, it's a cute little dog. And uh, the dog basically lives for maybe 7, 7.30 in the evening. I mean, she just 
stands on the top of the couch near the front door waiting in eager anticipation for me to take her for a walk around the block. And, uh, you know, I got this little harness, got a little pink harness that I put on her and uh, it's a cute little dog. Anyway, I'm not ashamed. And, uh, I mean, she's ready to go. That's like what she lives for, is for... To be, for me to put that harness on her, to put the leash on her, and for us to go one block around the neighborhood. And in some small way, I think that can illustrate that we are made for our lives to be ruled and directed and uh, mastered by Jesus Christ. And I think that's a the glimpse of what Matthew 11 28 through 30 talks about. Okay. Any questions about anything we've talked about so far? Any thoughts or statements you guys uh, have? So we're going to talk about Jesus the great I am, but what's one of the first what's one of the first questions when we think about Jesus saying I am? One of the first questions we think about ourselves should be this. Who am I? Jesus said, I'm uh, the bread of life, I'm the living, I'm the light of the world, I'm the good shepherd, all those other things. And when we hear him say, I am those things, we should ask the question, Who am I? And this, this question is is so huge. It's so huge. It's a question, especially a question that you are asking, whether you realize it or not, you're seeking to answer now in your life as you as you grow and develop into young men and young women. This is this is a question that is is in the back of of your mind. It's part of your your psyche. Who am I? Maybe you've asked that question uh, when you're going to sleep at night, you're, you're lying in the bed by yourself. Maybe you've asked the question after you've made big mistakes and you kind of look at yourself in the mirror and you think, who am I? Like, why did I do that? Uh, and we can ask that question when we have guilt, when we have shame. Sometimes we ask that question after we've done really well, like when we got the test results back from the ACT and you killed it and you're like, who am I? I'm the man. You know, that kind of thing. And uh, But think about it. There are labels that are all around us. There are labels that are inside our heads and in our minds. There are labels that other people have given to us. There are labels that we have said, you know what, that's that's one that I'm going to hold on to. I like that label for myself. There's some that haunt us. There's some that we wish we had. They're all labels. They're all statements about identity, aren't they? Who am I? These are in no particular order. They're probably way outdated. Um, what are some of those labels? Geek, Dork. I mean, are these like freak, funny, goofy, nerd, cool, goth, emo, um, athlete, weirdo? There's some that are a little bit harder too. Um, airhead, idiot, stupid, fat, slut. Gay, weak, slow, rich, poor, white, black. There are all kinds of labels that are floating around. There are all sorts of things that are vying for a place at the table when you ask this question and answer this question. Who am I? And Jesus Christ helps us answer that question. And it's not just for high school people. I'm 
turning 40 in two weeks. I still battle with insecurity and fear, and I wonder, who am I? Where do I fit? What do my neighbors think about me? What's my life about? Who am I? And uh, it, it kind of goes with this, but when we try to answer this question with things from this world, only with things from this world, those things don't have they don't have the ability to hold the weight and the dignity of who we are as human beings. And so, I mean, Richie touched on it some last night. I don't care how awesome you are at whatever you do. Uh, it's going to run its course. It's not going to be able to define who you are throughout your entire life. Uh, it will let you down. Um, a couple years ago, I was here at uh, Laguna Beach. I, I used to work for RUF, and we had this. We had a camp called Summer Conference, which is basically just like RYM. When you go to college, you can come back for summer conference and uh, it's here at Laguna Beach it's basically just like RYM just no no counselors so it's not as fun because the counselors are what make RYM awesome and uh, these are my jokes people uh, so uh, we had uh, the kayaks out on the beach you know people could take the kayaks out and, and it was a beautiful week no clouds. There was a, a north wind, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but which direction does a north wind blow? It blows south, I think. It's out of the north, and it blows south. It's kind of counterintuitive. So there was a there was a pretty good north wind, uh, but didn't you know didn't make much of a difference. So the wind the wind was blowing south. Who knows which direction in general south is from where we're sitting? Yeah, it's that way. What else is that way? The beach. Yeah, the beach is out there. So we had people have fun and free time in the afternoon. They got their kayaks out. They went out. They would paddle around. They went out to the second sandbar because they had a kayak and they had uh, life jackets. And they'd stop and they'd play and they'd splash water on each other. But the wind was blowing. And they didn't realize that every time they stopped, every time they took a break, every time they stopped paddling, that they were slowly being pushed further and further from the beach. And so, you know, by the time the lifeguards and some of the, the, uh, the campus ministers figured out what was going on, they were really far out there. And, uh, you know, we trying to get their attention. You've come back in, you've gone too far, and then... They kept going further and further. And these, maybe three or four kayakers literally got blown out to sea. And uh, we don't know what happened. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so the lifeguards, they had to go get like jet skis and boats and go out and tie them up. I mean, they had life jackets on. Their life wasn't imminently in danger, but we were watching... And we, they, the swell would go down. We couldn't see them, and then okay, there they are. And they went pretty far out. That would never happen this week. Uh, but the reason I tell that story is, if we try to live our lives without any sort of of anchor, any sort of of foundation, anything to tie our lives to, we're going to be blown kind of here and there. And there were two guys in particular that came back in. They were college guys. They were both on one kayak. They were like muscled up. I mean, just meathead dudes. They just loved the weight room. And they said, we were both paddling as hard as we could back and we couldn't make any headway. And if we try to live our lives without the gospel of Jesus Christ being at the core of who we are. We can have other things to find us. I like art. I like sports. I, you know, I play in the band. Uh, I enjoy math. Whatever. Those things are fine. But if at the center, at the core of who you are, if there's nothing like the bedrock of Jesus Christ and His Gospel, then there's nothing to hold us, our lives, sturdy and firm. And maybe you haven't you know, experienced 
that sense of being blown away or whatever before, but um, the thing that I want us to see this week is when we answer the question, who I am, who am I, uh, the key is to know and believe and come back to the fact that I am loved and accepted by God through Jesus Christ. I'm an adopted child in his family. The most significant thing about me is not anything that you could put on a resume. It's that my my life is hidden with God in Christ. And that's really, when we think about the question, who, I, who am I? I think that's really what Jesus is going to answer for us this week. Any questions about that portion? I have one more little thing, some fine print, and then we'll be done for today. Uh, And the game plan will be, tomorrow we'll look at a few of the I am statements, uh, kind of set the stage, and then we'll just walk through uh, each of the seven I am statements over the next few days. And um, (laughs) it's amazing how... um, Um, It's amazing how Jesus uh, speaks into our lives and how His his gospel and His grace... He not only says, I'm the bread of life and the the light of the world, He is able to give us that strength. So, some of the fine print. You guys know what the fine print is? Like in a contract. Most most high school folks haven't had to sign many contracts, but uh, what's the fine print? Yeah. Oh, uh, I thought you were raising your hand. Yeah. It's what you're not paying attention to. You might see, like, if you're buying a car and you says not in contract, you might see it costs this much money, and then you'll look at the bottom and says with this much interest, very yeah. really small. It's just stuff that they don't want you to notice. It's like, well, this might be a deal breaker for them, so let's make it really tiny, and maybe they won't think about it. Yeah, exactly. So this is kind of the fine print about this seminar. So it's not stuff I don't want you to know, but it is stuff that maybe you would not think about. If you maybe heard a car commercial on the radio, and they're like, this car is only $18, and then it's like, you know, all these things, and the car doesn't really exist. Um, So some of the fine print, some of the details about this week, two things that I want us to think about, and I want you to know. First of all... um, we're coming from a biblical perspective. And uh, RYM is a camp, your church back home. Um, this, this probably isn't news to you, but we're coming from a biblical perspective. So, uh, we believe that God has spoken into this world through prophets in His Word and that He's graciously done that for us. So the Bible is the thing that we're going to be leaning on uh, on every seminar, at large group, uh, in, in the life of our churches. And you know, if you are here this week and you have questions about the authority and the sufficiency and the clarity of the Bible, there are some really good resources about that. I'd love to talk to you about it that your youth director, your youth leader, we talked about it as well, but that's just where we're coming from. I want to say that up front, that the Bible is God's inspired, uh, His powerful word to us. The second is, uh, I know that we're coming from different places. And I don't mean uh, like Tennessee and Alabama and South Carolina, that kind of thing. Uh, when I When I say that I know that we're coming from different places, I know that there are folks here this week. Some people here are deeply committed to their relationship with Jesus Christ. And they want to learn and grow in Him and know more about who He is and what He's done for them. Um, But I also want you guys to understand that I know that there are people here this week, and you should think about this as well, there are people here who are not Christians, who came to camp... Maybe just like I did 25 years ago to uh, to meet girls and to have fun, and uh, 
who have no real grid about what Christianity is about. It's important for us to remember that there are folks like that at camp, maybe in the cabin with you. Uh, so there are some who are committed Christians, some who are like, I don't care, I could come to the beach for a week. There are others that, that may be somewhere in between. So you maybe have been brought up in the church, uh, you've been brought up uh, given Christianity, and now you're at a crossroads where you're trying to decide, is this going to be the thing that shapes and defines who I am? Am I going to own this faith, this reality for myself? And, uh, you know, that's, that's really a, a great place to be because we don't want you to simply be Christian and go to church because it's what your parents did. We want it to be yours. We want you to own it and it to be the core and center of who you are, not because someone's telling you to do it, but because you've come to be convinced that Jesus Christ is the way the truth, and the life. So that's some of the fine print. Biblical perspective, and uh, we come from different places. All right. Any questions before we close this morning? Any comments? Okay. I appreciate you guys. I appreciate your attentiveness, and uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Let's close in prayer. God, we praise You and thank You again uh, for Jesus Christ, a loving and compassionate yet powerful and mighty Savior. And I pray that You would uh, just be with us this week, be at work in us. I pray that people who aren't Christians might see the beauty of Jesus and be converted to Him. I pray that folks who are would be established in their faith and folks that kind of don't know where they are, that You'd give them clarity and help them to see who you are and who they are. And teach us about that the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all.